Okay, so we're starting to form a kind of hypothesis about how the writer of Hebrews might be rapping to Peter, Jude, and Mark all at the same time. Peter and Jude is about the priesthood and the spirits and the false teachers. Mark is talking about false teachers and hardness of heart despite the miracles and wonders and signs. And the first time that Mark starts to talk about any kind of doctrine that Christ taught, it was right here. In the, in the guise of, you know, the disputation, okay, these are all the miracles of appointing the twelve, and then the miracle of the tax collectors and sinners following him, okay, and then we have the opposition. The Pharisees getting all upset about him, you know, eating with the sick. We'll see, but he had just finished showing the miracles. Okay, so what's it's the deepest kind of sickness of all is disbelief. And here are tax collectors and sinners actually listening to him, but the Pharisees are not. And so there's no point in, you know, beating them over the head with it. So he tells them the obvious I didn't call to come, come to call the righteous, but sinners. Yeah, and the Pharisees are sinners, but won't admit it. They think they're holy because they fast. Okay? So he gently tries to remind them, or maybe he's not being so gentle. <laughs> yeah, I'm the bridegroom. Why are you talking about fasting? See, he's the bridegroom. But they don't believe he's, he's Messiah. He's the bridegroom. See, Israel's supposed to be the bride. He's the bridegroom. That means Messiah. It can't mean anything else. Days will come when the bridegroom Messiah will be taken from them. Yeah, Isaiah 53, 5. And they'll fast on that day. Okay, and then as a result of the bridegroom being taken, New Covenant, which is the book of Hebrews. Okay, and we covered also in the last increment, passing through the grain fields, this was legal to do under the law. Didn't matter if it was on the Sabbath. The Pharisees are saying, oh, that's not legal on the Sabbath. Yeah, because they're adding to the law to make themselves feel more holy about themselves. And he said, oh, you want, you want to talk about holy? How about David eating the holy bread, which was not even lawful for anybody but the priests? Yeah, because David was a partaker of the bread of heaven, namely Christ, as so are we. Therefore, let's not do what the guys on the left are doing. Let's do what David did instead. Okay? Partaker of Christ. That's what David's doing on the left-hand side. In blue. See? So the book of Hebrews is tracking. But he's still, he's folding between Peter and Jude and Mark. And so he's got the priesthood theme and the false teacher theme and the warning theme of the temple going down, which Mark is also addressing. Okay? being really, you know, bald about it, see, 40 years. 40 years is almost up on the temple. Okay? Eat the consecrated bread because time is going to be up. Because the Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Okay? Now, at this point, Hebrews 4.1 talks about the rest. What kind of rest is it? All right, and what kind of rest that remains a Sabbath rest? It's not talking about real estate. It's talking about the Word of God. How do you rest from your works? By God doing His works in you. And this should be spudazo, should be eager, not diligent. A legalistic guy who is all caring about his works translated that verse. It should be translated eager, and it's a key word in Peter. So we know that he's tracking the Peter. The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any Machaira. And of course, that's how Peter ended his epistle, growing grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay, the knowledge, not works. And that's, of course, how Jude ended. All right? So, nothing's hidden. We have a great high priest. Let us hold fast to our confession. In other words, don't doubt the word. All right? It's not that we don't have a priest who can't sympathize with our weaknesses. See, look, 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 look. Okay. Whoops. Let's 
See, here's the word near, but this is proserchomai here. He's not using Mark's keyword angus, either angus or utus. This is proserchomai. This is mean when you come near to a throne, or you come near to a, to a temple or an altar. Okay? And here it's the throne of grace. This is echoing Paul in Romans 5. Okay? That the whole theme of Romans 5 is right here. That's how Paul begins the chapter. Okay? So now he's going to continue on the high priesthood. He's going to greatly elaborate on high priesthood. Mark, by contrast, is still on the theme of the Pharisees' objections to Christ, their legalism. Okay? So there's a... So there's sort of like... We're going back to, he's going back to talking about what Peter meant when he said you are a holy priesthood in, what is it, First Peter 2, 5, and 9. Okay, he's elaborating on Peter there. All right, whereas Mark is still talking about the actual priests in Israel who are fighting him. Okay, and now they're saying, oh, are you going to heal him on the Sabbath? Because that's a work. See, he ended with Sabbath. So that's why Mark is staying on that theme. Okay, now we go, Mark goes back to miracles again. Healing on the Sabbath. And so Christ knows that, so, you know. And by the way, this is a mistranslation. And um, I'm going to do some videos on that. There, it, there's a construction using the word meta. I'll have to show this. this. There's a very famous scholar who screws this, uh, this up very badly. Okay. And it's kind of embarrassing that he would do this. See this phrase here, metorges? All right? There are actual famous, really famous, even I like them, Bible scholars who are trying to tell you that it's Christ who's angry here. Well, I'm sorry, that's flat wrong. There are 12 constructions in the New Testament using this kind of construction here. The meta goes with the previous referent, which is autus, meaning it's their anger, not Christ's. Okay? They're angry at Christ. It's their anger. All right? See? Masculine plural. This is not Christ's anger. This is the anger of the crowd at him. Okay? Christ is grieved. All right. See, this is this is what Christ is doing. See, I, I don't know. Can scholars be more inept? This is what Christ is doing. Participle, masculine, singular, meaning Christ is is doing the verb. But this is autus metorges. It's their anger. And the phrase when meta has a referent in front of it, met the the phrase that belongs to meta goes with. The referent in front of meta. There are 12 different uses of meta in the New Testament, in I think mostly in the Gospels, that prove the point that it's there, it's going with the referent prior. It's just a gaffe. It's a grammar gaffe by some very famous Bible scholars. They're ignoring the fact that Altus is in front of meta. And when you have a referent in front of meta, it means that the referent is getting, as it were, meta is acting as an adjectival phrase about the referent right in front of it. Okay? Right in front of it. So it's not Christ being angry. Christ is being grieved, and it even tells you so, masculine singular. Okay? That's what Christ is. He is not angry. This is not Christ's anger. This is the crowd's anger. It's their anger. It should be translated in English with their anger. They being, he's looking around at them. That's masculine singular. At them. See, them is in front of meta. Them with their anger, not Christ with his. When Ephesians 4.23, is it 4.23? It's Ephesians 4 somewhere it says, Be angry, but do not sin. That's a bad translation. My pastor laughed at that when he exegeted it. It means stop being angry and stop sinning. That's how it should have been translated. 
but see if you're legalistic like the people the people in the mark passage that he's reviewing and you like being angry okay their hardness of heart looking at them with their anger is how that ought to be translated their hardness of heart okay but if you too are you know legalistic when you're translating you're going to make you're going to want to justify your anger and make it God's isn't that sad anger is a sin it's always a sin there's never a time when it isn't a sin and in case I'm being angry because I can never tell sometimes if it's enthusiasm or true anger so I just use 1 John 1 9 in case I'm being angry too because I sound angry all right you can say you can say nasty words to a person and that doesn't mean you're angry it depends on what's going on in your head when you do it you know because sometimes anger the, the words of anger are rhetorical style all right when Christ is reasoning with people a lot he uses words of anger but he's not angry it's it's a debating technique to use sharp words doesn't mean that that's actually how you feel about it all right but see here they are okay they're watching him oh if he heals on the Sabbath he's bad he's violating the law okay now look at the right hand side Hebrews 5 he's our high priest isn't the priest supposed to work on the Sabbath huh isn't that the day that he works and everybody else rests okay so he's high priest caught a Melchizedek see this is why that doctrine gets introduced so he better be working on the Sabbath otherwise we can't get our food but see they don't believe he's Messiah they don't believe he's high priest caught a Melchizedek which is Psalm 110 that's his second office that's how come church is separate from Israel okay but the point is is that he is king priest and what should a priest be doing but working on the Sabbath that's his day to work the rest of the week he prepares for that day now I'll talk more about that in the next increment because my computer's going nuts I'm going to sort of go off topic for a minute because when I see something that it's important I feel I ought to say it before I forget okay here's the verse that talks about Hebrews 5 7 in the days of his flesh let me get rid of the window first and I'll reinstate it in the days of his flesh he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death and he was heard because of his piety you just know that the guy who translated or the committee who approved this translation of Hebrews 5 were all proud of their works this isn't what the text really means see when you can get away with a meaning from words and you got some leeway in the semantic range of those words to spin it so it gives the meaning you want then you're gonna do that now I want you to notice the right hand side the translation of Hebrews 5 7 is doing exactly the same thing as the left hand side in Mark 2 3 verse 2 looking for an occasion to accuse in other words they're saying oh because he was pious so I should do good works too honey that is not what the writer of Hebrews is trying to explain He's giving the opposite, actually, information. So now let's go look at the Greek. And here's your key word to prove it. Here's the word translated piety. Eulabaya. There's eulabaya, eusabaya, asabaya, lots of bias. Okay? So let's look at what this word really means, okay? Its real meaning is circumspection. Okay? Godly fear and reverence? No. That's what a legalist would turn it into. That's not what it is. 
And whenever you got a doubt between the, the whatchamacallit, the different lexicons, the best guy who really gets to the heart of it is Thayer. And you can get Thayer's lexicon for free now. If you have the Word software, which is the free version of Bible closest to BibleWorks, BibleWorks is what I'm using, Thayer, you can get Thayer's lexicon for free. Okay, because it's over 100 years old, so there's no copyright fee on it. All right, I suggest you get it. If you use no other lexicon but Thayer, you, you're not going to go too wrong too often. Okay, I love this guy's lexicon. Because what he likes to do is he likes to trace etymology. See, the Bible's real big on the root meaning of words. Because then it uses those words like a thesaurus. Okay, so you got you, which means good. Okay, and then you got labaya. And it's talking about the character and the context of one is eulabes. Okay, eulabes is the root from which eulabaya, the noun, comes from. Okay? Caution, circumspection, discretion. That's used that way in Sophocles, Euripides, Plato, Demosthenes, and in Proverbs. Okay? Joined with pronoia, which is talking about analytical thinking, and Plutarch and Marcel. Idea of prudence. Now think about this, okay? When you are a ruler, what's the most important characteristic you need to have? Caution and circumspection and discretion. Why? Because you have the power. It's not piety. It's being real careful with the power you have. And what kind of power are we talking about here? The power of prayer. Remember he said to us, ask anything in my name and I'll do it. That's a power we are given. That's like saying, hi, you want something? You can snap your fingers like Endora on Bewitched, the sitcom Bewitched, and I'll give it to you. Uh oh. So what are you going to do? Honey, you're going to be circumspect about how you use that much power. You're not going to have godly fear. That's not the first meaning of it. It's what results. Gee, I can ask God anything in his name and he'll do it? God is going to do whatever I ask? Honey, if you care at all about God and you have any sense at all about what great power means, you're going to be very, very circumspect and cautious about what you ask God to do. See, it's the opposite of the translation. The translation makes it sound like, oh, because he's such a nice guy and he's being so respectful in his words, God heard his prayer. As if prayer wasn't something that you had a right to do. As if prayer wasn't something that God granted you. You had to work for it. That's the opposite of what Eula bias means. Because it's the opposite of what the power of prayer is. Do you want the terrorist killed? Ask God to do it. But, and this is what I did, I did ask him to do it. But as I was asking him to do it, I'm using Eula bias. Caution, circumspection, well wait a minute God. Yeah, I want them killed, but what if you don't? What if the, some of the terrorists that I want killed, if I just say blanket, kill them? What if they might believe in Christ in the next five minutes? Then I don't want them killed until those five minutes are up at least. And then after the five minutes are up, if they believe in Christ, wouldn't it be more profitable to you to keep them alive? I don't know. I don't have enough information to be sure of what I should pray to you. That's you, Labias. When you're the ruler and you have absolute power, and prayer is an absolute power, the Lord said six times in the Gospels, ask anything in my name and I'll do it. That's scary. The power of God himself is deliberately delegated to you. And why is that? Because you're an heir of Christ. That's the theme of the book of Hebrews. Now contrast this on the left-hand side, because I still think that he's tracking the mark. They're waiting to see if he's going to do a divine act 
that the divine power on the Sabbath, as if somehow God is not allowed to be God on Saturday. That's as bad as Richard Dawkins in his stupid book, The God Delusion, saying God has to be the end product of an evolutionary process. Yet on page 41, prior to chapter 4, where he talks about this evolution nonsense, on page 41 he says, oh, I'm only talking of supernatural gods. So Dawkins can't think his way out of a paper bag, and neither can these Pharisees. They're watching him to see if he would heal. Heal him, that's a miracle. Only God can do miracles, right? So they're going to try to convict God for acting like God because he's doing it on the Sabbath? See, even an atheist is more moral than these guys. Isn't this sick? Yeah, and by contrast, he who is our king priest is doing what? He's being real circumspect. Circumspect. He knows he has absolute power. How do you use it? Okay? These guys wouldn't know how to use divine power if it bit them. But Christ is divine power. He's God-man. He's the one who would know better than anybody else what absolute power is. And he gets to ask Father anything he wants because he's not in a state of sin. How do you use that power, believer? With circumspection, caution, discretion. Not like the guys on the left who are saying God isn't allowed to act like God on the Sabbath. They were waiting to see if he would heal him. In other words, they believe he's God because they expect him to, to heal. But they don't believe he's God enough to believe that he's Messiah and has the right to do what a priest has the right to do. Priest is a priest to God. If the priest can work on the Sabbath, why can't God? You see the point? Is this disgusting or not? So is Hebrews 5, 7 tracking to Mark? I'm voting yes. It's not the kind of tracking I expected. And honey, just strike this word piety. Just This was Calvin's favorite word. He was a retard like you can't believe. Oh, our piety. And piety to him was the right behavior. Okay? Piety. 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 Throw that word out of your vocabulary, honey, because that is not what eulabias means. Eulabias means absolute power. Now, how do you use it? In this context, especially because it's the power of prayer. Well, what are you going to do? Honey, you have the right. This is really important. You have the right to tell God, ask God to kill all the terrorists. You can just say right now, God, I ask in Jesus' name, kill all the terrorists. And what if he did that? Is that really the right answer? What if a terrorist who, by being a terrorist and doing something cruel, and this is a really hard thing to think about, but as a ruler, you got to learn to make these judgment calls. If the terrorist is allowed to do his terrorist act in Boston or New York or Bangkok, and as a result, somebody believes in Christ. In other words, they wouldn't have believed in Christ if that terrorist attack didn't occur. Should God allow the terrorist attack or not? That's a hard judgment call. A president of the United States has to make a judgment call that the troops he's sending in harm's way, a lot of them are going to die or come back wounded and their lives will be ruined. Does he send the troops anyhow? For what? Do you remember the story Hamburger Hill, the movie Hamburger Hill? That's one of the movies that's impressed me the most for all time. That and Dash Boot. Okay? Or Dash Boot. I don't, I don't remember my German anymore. Okay? How do you make the judgment call? Hamburger Hill. So many lives lost crawling up the mud in the rain. And then 20 minutes later, after we won, the enemy gets the territory back. Maybe it wasn't 20 minutes, it might have been 20 days. But all those lies for nothing. So now you have the right to ask God to wipe out the Muslim terrorists or any terrorists. Do you do that? Or do you use caution 
and circumspection and say, well, you know what, I really don't have all the facts. I'm, you know, on the one hand, they ought to die. On the other hand, well, what, what loss is going to occur if they die? To God, what loss to God? What's the value of a saved life? versus the people who die, who either believed anyway, so they're going to heaven if they die, okay? Or they were never gonna believe in the first place and God knows. What do you ask him? See, it's not piety. It's caution, circumspection, discretion. And what is not being used here? Caution, discretion, circumspection. If they were using caution, circumspection, discretion, which would translate, of course, into godly fear, but that's the next stage. Where is it in these Pharisees who are so religious on the left versus the religious translation of Hebrews 5-7 on the right? Somebody should fire the translators of the NAU. And it's not better in the other translations. I don't want this to turn into more of a rant than it is. But do you see, there is an important distinction being made between religiosity and the real priesthood that you've got, which is absolute power of prayer. And what are you going to do knowing once you know that you've got that? Every believer in Christ has that. All you have to do is use 1 John 1, 9, ask Father and Son's name for anything. Ask in my name and I'll do it. Blanket statement in the Gospels. Well, then what is going to be your reaction if you're a sane person? Caution, circumspection, discretion. Yeah, maybe you should ask God for a billion dollars. You know, I made a video a long time ago where I, you know, said, you know, you could do that and he'll make it appear on your kitchen table if you wanted it. And then I was afraid to ask him. I really don't want the money, actually, because that's just more problems. I already got what I need. Money's the last thing I want more of. Okay. I need more time. You either got money or you got time. You never have both. Okay, fine. So I did ask him, but in my heart of hearts, while I'm asking him, I said to him basically, I'm asking you this because I, I ought to, in case you want it done. But I don't really want the money. And I didn't get it, thank God. You see the point? Caution, circumspection, discretion. Let's say you're afflicted with cancer, some other disease. What if you're going to grow more spiritually as a result of keeping that disease versus asking God to heal you? He's going to heal a guy here, and the Pharisees don't want him to do it because, oh, it's on the Sabbath, even though he'd be doing a miracle. They wanted to see if he would heal, so they believed he could do that. Well, only God can do that. Oh, but if it's on the Sabbath, oh, that's sacrilege. What, it's sacrilege for God to do a miracle on the Sabbath. Isn't that what the Sabbath is for? The miracle of learning. Huh? Of course, that's in Hebrews 5.8. I'm getting ahead of myself. Is it suffering if it's learning? But anyway, you see the point? Prayer, a miracle power you have given to you by God. And what did Christ do with it? He used caution and circumspection, not piety. End rant. I'm shutting up now, and then I'll get back to